when we were planning this panel, we referred to it for weeks as the big picture panel. And these four folks and our moderator are going to answer all of the questions that we came up with over the last six, seven hours about the future of Flint and other cities like it around the world. So without further ado, Brent Ryan, you want to come up? Good afternoon, everyone. Is this um, audible? Yep. Yes. So I'm the warm up for some very entertaining speakers. It's late in the day, and so the speakers and I, um, we, or the, I should say, we the speakers have, um, <laughs> we will not hold a formal Q&A session afterward because of time pressures, but um, some those of us who can will stay around for individual, is this on? Yeah. Comments and questions. Okay. Um, my name is Brent Ryan, and I'm coming from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and um, I'm a scholar of deindustrializing cities. I'm an urban designer, and uh, I've uh, recently written a book about Detroit and Philadelphia and those cities' redevelopment challenges. I was asked to speak broadly about what a master plan process might mean for Flint, um, how master plans might be meaningful and relevant in the city. And uh, so without being from Flint and without knowing what the master plan is going to be, I thought I would share some perspectives from my broader studies of, of deindustrializing cities and talk about some particular issues that are likely to be an issue in, in Flint's master planning process. So I'm titling my uh, presentation Top Down or Ad Hoc, and I think it's kind of a false opposition because I think any effective plan needs to be a combination of both, but what that combination is is, is not known yet. Um, I will, I'll show quickly some photographs of projects in deindustrializing cities, and these represent different programmatic possibilities. The first is a proposal for social housing in North Philadelphia called Paseo Verde. This is a mixed-use complex. It will be sustainable as well as affordable to its residents. Um, so it combines a lot of desirable features of modern housing. The next is a project that's so famous, it's almost a cliche, the High Line. <laughs> Very expensive project. My, my figure is $100 million per mile. But um, it is a very generous reactivation of derelict infrastructure. And so it's a, it's a very clean and clever design. And it speaks well to this um, issue of, of infrastructure. And lastly is a mobile party that my students proposed last year in East St. Louis, Illinois, on a, um, in a rail yard. This is a space that would be temporarily activated for cultural events where boxcars would become dance floors and rail yards would become festival grounds um, because of the energy and creativity of residents. So these are exciting issues and these are exciting ideas, but these are not yet where Flint is today. Uh, we've seen that Flint has very large abandoned areas as well as very small ones and a very serious demolition and rehabilitation challenge. So any master plan obviously will have to confront these problems and move Flint ideally toward the excitement and life that we see in projects like uh, the ones that I showed. Uh, Flint will not be able to do this in the old-fashioned way of the old generation of master plans. This is Newark's master plan from 1964. came out around the same time as Flint's most recent master plan. And it had a very different vision of massive change backed by massive amounts of money and massive political support at the federal level, none of which exist today. Uh, the vision, in short, was one of massive change. This is what New York was proposing at the time. Um, social housing, tall and abstract and rather brutal, occupying a public park. So the idea was forget the old city, bring in a new city. And you notice there's older buildings at the uh, bottom here, but they're essentially ignored by the drawing. Um, we know that this strategy didn't work and that this large-scale transformation caused as many problems as it solved. This is a picture of St. Louis imploding the pruitt Igo public housing in 1972. And at this point, the era of top-down planning was declared over. Planning changed its tune. And today, we favor bottom-up solutions with citizen engagement, workshops, public dialogue, small-scale, often modest projects. These are popular and can even be transformative, at least to the local level. So the question is, what does a plan mean in Flint? It's unlikely to be top-down. The money simply doesn't exist, and the support shouldn't exist either. Does that mean it will be bottom-up and ad hoc? Um, let me make a proposal. 
I'll propose that there's two contrasting visions of what a city can be, or at least two visions of how planning can act in a city. Here I'm showing Newark again. This is what I call the unified city, where planning acts everywhere at the same time in a uniform way. This is what zoning means. So these plans affect all areas of the city equally because they are, in fact, a total vision for the city. This is another vision for the city. Um, this is the disconnected city where um, plans and planning build individual projects, each of which is interesting, but they have nothing to do with each other. It's a city of disconnected elements and pieces. Architects find this vision very appealing because it emphasizes the autonomy and individuality of buildings, but it doesn't provide an overall sense of a plan's purpose or of the city's future. And notice all the white spots on the map. These are neighborhoods that are left out of this plan. So I'm interested in a third vision a city where a plan can have special impacts in special places, but also a place where change in one area can influence change in another for the better. And this, this vision, um, this is based on a 1960 idea by uh, MIT um, city planning professor. There's no final version of a city, but he projects a city that's always changing, sometimes growing, it's sometimes shrinking, um, and where good things are spread around and impact many people. Can this happen in Flint? Let's look at a couple of realities first. These are not necessarily pretty realities of the situation. Um, we know that uh, Flint has pretty low property values for the most part. So zoning, which usually operates on the basis of new development, it's hard for zoning to have an effect until the market recovers. In the meantime, zoning is much more of an impediment than it is a help. It fixes the city in old form and old uses instead of allowing it to change. So zoning can actually stand in the way of positive change at a point where Flint is today. Uh, this is a, uh, an area near the former Buick City. And uh, this shows, as we already know, that Flint has a lot of empty land, but it's either very large and usually locked away, like Buick City. This is owned by the Racer Trust, which is the, um, the trust that inherited a lot of General Motors land. Or it's very small and scattered. And we can see here, despite the good efforts of the land bank, that the land that they own is very small and scattered. And there are many vacant parcels that the land bank doesn't own. At the same time, the amount of these empty parcels is growing, so something has to be done. Obviously, Flint cannot stand still, and there's a strong imperative for action, which I think is motivating uh, the master planning effort. So this is what you could call growth. It's a growth of empty land near Buick City between 1999 and 2011. So we have two contrasting versions for Flint. One is the idea of a perfect top-down design city like Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, built in four years. The other is a place of informal and bottom-up activity where the scale of the problem is very large, but where action happens incrementally. Um, these solutions are fascinating, and yet when there are so many vacant lots, like the one, just like the vacant lots in the small neighborhood that we're examining, we see that Flint needs master planning that operates at a larger scale and that is somewhere in the middle. Um, in my work, I've looked at this future for deindustrializing cities in which growth that is then followed by decline is not the end of a city's life and it's not the final story. In the <coughs> Instead, we see that a city can begin rebuilding at different scales in different places. Even as it continues to lose population in some areas, it grows in others. Over time, we get a new and different city appearing that resembles the old in some ways but is totally new in others. This would be my ideal vision for a city like Flint. in my last slide. So neither top-down nor ad hoc, I suggest instead a flexible Flint, um, a city that is planning for new neighborhoods, not just the demolition of old ones, uh, new landscapes that are recovered from industry like we've seen, and ephemeral projects that can occupy areas temporarily like the Flint Public Art Project is doing so well. Plans will have to be flexible on their operation as well, such as capturing federal money when and if it appears. New federal initiatives do appear, even though the federal government is generally totally uninterested in cities, and scheduled actually to go broke, I think on January 30th. So we'll see how that debate plays out. Um, any plan will have to activate environmental potentials and think at the environmental scale, which can be very long term. And of course, every plan should celebrate the energy and activity that's already in the city, such as the, what's happening, getting to happen already. So unlike in old plans, there's no year X where the plan finishes. 
Instead, a plan will have many time frames, all of which are different. Short term for temporary activity, long, long term for environmental recovery, and then unknown term for opportunities that might come when and if new federal policies that are attached to money arise. Lastly, I think Flint itself needs to be very flexible, and I think um, people in Flint should be proud of the fact that the city's doing much better than other cities in similar circumstances. So the city's leadership is pragmatic and creative despite substantial limitations. Um, it will also need policymakers who are wise rather than being stubborn or stuck in visions based in the past. And everyone is interested in a better city after all. And of course, it can't happen without Flint citizens believing that the master plan process can change the city for the better. Thank you very much. I think our computer operators can take this picture. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. I have to say that Brent stole a lot of my fire. Uh, so a lot of what he's talking about is kind of the approach that we're hoping to take here in Flint. Um, so actually with that, I probably will focus a little bit more on um, working from the bottom up, which is, which is our goal. Um, Um, so I think, I, I don't really want to reiterate too much because I'm sure you've heard this before, but uh, Flint has changed a lot since its peak in 1960. Um, one thing that's important is to kind of give you planning of Flint in context. At the time of our last plan, which was 1960, we anticipated um, a actual increase in population to, to about 400,000. We had a peak population of 197,000. We had 80,000 GM jobs, 80,000 in the city. And that meant that we could not house the people that we had working in GM plants. So a lot of things that we encouraged were suburbanization. And some of the housing that was built was of poor quality because um, we had to build quickly. Today, um, as I know that Doug talked a lot about population decline. Uh, there was a question about where we are in terms of our population. We're still declining. Uh, there was an article recently that Flint is losing about 8.3 people a day. The good news is that population decline is starting to stabilize and we're seeing actually slower decline over time. But we still have a tremendous amount of vacancy. About one-fifth of our housing stock is vacant and we have 20,000 blighted properties. But um, as the gentleman said, probably Flint's biggest challenge is public safety. Public safety is putting us uh, in the spotlight uh, nationally, and it's something that we know we have to address in the master plan. Talked a little bit about the history already. The one thing that's really interesting about Flint that's a little bit unique is Flint was built around public parks and schools. We were the, the pioneers of the community school movement, and so we had very walkable neighborhoods that were based around green space. A little bit about our components of our master plan, um, and then I want to talk more about community engagement. Uh, we just started the master plan. Really, we officially kicked it off in uh, spring of 2012. Uh, and right now, what we're really focusing on is data collection to really know what the existing conditions are. And the other thing that we're starting to work on right now is community engagement. Um, we have set, laid the foundation to allow for people to be involved in community engagement on an ongoing basis. Uh, but we also are trying to get you know, a lot of residents involved in community engagement. And I passed out a flyer to you on our first round of townhouse style meetings, so hopefully you can attend those. Um, the components of the master plan will, will have the traditional kind of components. We'll talk about land use, transportation and mobility, housing, economic development, urban design, open space, and environmental features, and of course community facilities and infrastructure. But really what's different, um, what we're really trying to do that's a little bit different in Flint is really focus on other things, understanding that the issues in Flint that are most important to people are public safety, 
health, and education. And we cannot just be a traditional sort of master plan and ignore those key components of, of what is important to people in Flint. And also, we really have to focus on making it something that's implementable. We will have an implementation strategy which will tell us how, what, where, when, how to actually further the goals and objectives of the plan. This is not meant to be a plan that sits on the shelf, but a plan that's actionable. So where we are in the process, um, there's two components of our master plan process. One is sort of the traditional plan making process where we actually craft a master plan. But the second part is the implementation, which is actually creating this implementation strategy, uh, zoning and capital improvement plan. So we're, like I said, we're very early in the process right now. We're at basically what do we have now and that's kind of doing the data analysis that you need to in order to have an effective plan and we're working on some preliminary uh, engagement work around what is it that we want we're working on the visioning process um, I don't really want to talk too much about data analysis but just know that um, part of what we're trying to do is actually make <coughs> the data accessible to, to residents and community stakeholders, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that. I'm going to focus a lot today on talking about community engagement, because Brent is right. We're taking uh, the philosophy that this plan is only going to be effective if it comes from the ground up. It can't be a top-down plan. So we've uh, organized our community engagement piece around the concept that we would allow for different levels of engagement for people who have different levels of time. We have a community engagement piece that is meant for people who may not be able to attend a community meeting, who may be very busy, but they can go on a website and they can fill out an online survey. They can go to the library and look at the plan and leave a comment in a, a comment box and drop it off. Uh, they can take our community mapper and map on the plan, um, on, on the map, what are some interesting things that we need to know when we're thinking about planning for Flint. For people who have a little bit more time, we have a moderate time commitment uh, process where people can engage in a community workshop. The first community workshop is to identify issues, assets, and challenges in Flint. But we're also going to be doing, later on, a community visioning process where everyone can come together, a thousand people with America Speaks, to actually drill down and get consensus on goals and objectives. But what we're most proud about is the, um, the most intensive, really getting people empowered into the process. People who are going to be involved on an ongoing basis in the plan. So we have our planning commission, but in addition we have a, a steering committee comprised of 21 community stakeholders, and the steering committee has convened what we call advisory groups. We have six advisory groups. We have about 25 people per advisory group on them. Two-thirds are Flint residents, and these advisory groups enable us to focus on key components of the master plan, including public safety, which is, is the most important issue for residents in Flint. And I just wanted to have a hand, um, I think there's some people in the audience who may be on an advisory group, so if you could raise your hand if you're on an advisory group. Great. So um, we're, we're really um, proud of that component. The approach to civic engagement, I, I don't want to read it to you, but I think that generally we want to make sure that people of all ages are races, socioeconomic background, and abilities across all of Flint can, be, can participate in the process. And the other thing is, ultimately, the plan is only as good as it's going to be implemented. So we are trying to build leadership. We're trying to build folks who are going to feel empowered to go out and actually implement the plan above and beyond just the city. Um, so we, we use this kind of, uh, I want to say, this level of, increasing level of civic engagement as kind of our organizing factor of how we engage the public. We want to go beyond just inform, 
we want to actually empower. So this is kind of the, the uh, level of engagement that we're looking across. How do we hit the category in each of these? Inform, consult, engage, collaborate, and empower. <coughs> Obviously, informing is, is uh, as I mentioned, about the website and other uh, materials that are accessible to people. We also want to consult people, but ultimately what we want to do is engage in, collaborate and empower a large number of folks. There are, like I said, 150 people that are going to be providing ongoing um, feedback into the process, and hopefully these are going to be our champions moving forward. <coughs> I just wanted to highlight real quickly some of the things that we feel make our process a little bit unique. Um, we focus on ongoing participation. We are really keen on highlighting the local stories. There are people who are doing amazing things in Flint. We took uh, the EPA on Friday out on a site visit. And what they said to us is, wow, Flint looks better than what we thought. We just went to Gary, Indiana, and <coughs> compared to Gary, you guys look really good. You know, and one of the things, the, one of the reasons why we look so good is because of the people, the people who continue to uh, take care of your, your neighbor's yards, who continue to help out on abandoned property, who are planting gardens everywhere, who are starting community programs for youth. This is um, a very active community. So we want to focus and channel that in, through ongoing participation. In addition, we know we can incorporate nonprofits, institutions, and foundations, as well as residents, as partners in implementation. And I think one of the other things that is unique is we are not just gathering data and presenting it in a very stale way, but we're actually integrating residents into collecting the data that we're going to be using that will help inform the master plan process. So, for example, um, we recently trained um, about 90 people, 28 community groups, to go out and do housing inventory um, of their neighborhoods and return that data back to us so that can help us make decisions on the master plan. And I have to say that these residents actually did probably a better job in really truly assessing their neighborhoods than Planned, and then trained planners. So it goes to show you that we take for granted the, the power of neighborhood uh, folks. Sorry about this. <laughs> so I just, these are just some highlights of kind of engagement process that we, we've worked on. Um, again, focusing on ongoing community collaboration a market, marketing-based strategy on real people. Let's highlight what's really great about Flint. Um, the community uh, flyer that I passed around, the workshop flyer, was about the peace mob. Um, so you'll see as we go on some of the great things that our people are doing. Um, this is the, um, the Crate Company, which is a great new business in downtown Flint, and I think one of the owners is back there in the picture. And um, this is the Bur Burston Bike Club, which was started by a resident who felt like um, kids were not biking in Flint because they didn't feel safe. And so she goes around and takes kids on their bike throughout uh, different neighborhoods in Flint. And what it shows is that people see these kids riding through areas of Flint where no one's ever ridden a bike before and are starting to change their attitudes. So it's, it's an increasing... Um, the number of bikers in Flint just by virtue of seeing other people doing it. Um, and then this is a picture of our trainings that we had where we trained community folks to gather data. And I, like I said, I think this is a really important aspect of the, the planning process. Um, the one thing I did want to highlight is some of the key lessons that we've learned from other legacy cities and we like to use the word legacy cities and not shrinking cities because while uh, we're losing population, legacy cities imply some other challenging issues like the infrastructure that we are left with, which is a blessing in a way because we have great infrastructure, but it's a challenge because 
it's not easy, as uh, some gentleman said, is cutting off the sewer. Um, everything is interlinked, so it presents a lot of challenges to uh, shrink the city. Um, there's social considerations as well. You can't just cut off someone who's been making a community uh, or, or a neighborhood that has been there for you know, 50 years who are totally dedicated to it. So we like to use the word legacy because I think it implies a lot of different challenges uh, moving forward. Um, but we have learned some key lessons from uh, working with other legacy cities. And one is that we have to develop a plan that's, that's, that's community driven, but based on real data. We can't pretend that we're gonna be back to the way Flint was but it doesn't mean that we can't build a flexible, as Brent was saying, city that can, can either uh, grow if you know, the time comes and Flint does gain some population or continue to shrink in a reasonable way. We have to accept that being smaller is okay. There's no, no problem with uh, losing population. And I think this allows us a great chance to be more green to think about sustainability in our planning. As Brent said, we need to allow for flexible land uses, but we also need to connect uh, different parts of the neighborhood with each other through transit corridors or other development. We can't just leave islands or pockets of development um, in, in a sea of, of vacant areas. And um, we have to involve, as I've stressed before, people more in just the plan development, but also the implementation. So uh, I know tomorrow you're going to be looking at the Chevy and the whole site. So uh, we're very interested in hearing what you're going to talk about. And this is it. Um, and these are some of the visions that people have had. So I really look forward to your ideas on how to utilize that site. Thank you. <coughs> Um, so I know it's been uh, it's been a long day. I uh, appreciate you sticking it out here, and uh, I'm going to try to move through the material yet fairly quickly uh, to get to some questions following, uh, even though I might have to to depart. Um, so it's it is difficult to take uh, what's ostensibly uh, two and a half years of work and put it into about 15 minutes to present to you today, but we're going to try. Um, and uh, by necessity and actually by design, um, I've decided to actually use um, a much shortened version of a presentation that we have used uh, with the public in our civic engagement process. Because I think sometimes, as an architect and an urban designer, um, you know, I'm guilty of this where we might work on a project day to day and we come to, to an opportunity like this to, to present amongst our peers, we really create a very nice looking presentation, a very slick document uh, that we, we want to put out there. And I, I kind of want to, I kind of want to let, let you see this project as, really, as it really is and, and, and what it looks like when we, when we talk with the community. That's really what this thing uh, is at, at its core. Um, so, um, and as I talked about this as being a presentation to the community, you should know that this is a deeply participatory process. Uh, you all discussed this at, at, at length. Um, so it's at the very core of, of the project and is why the project is essentially bifurcated between two parts. There's a technical planning team, of which I am a part, of which Jill Allen from Stoss Landscape Urbanism is a part. She spoke earlier uh, on uh, landscape open space and ecology. Um, and we have a full, full civic engagement team that, that, uh, that works with us. Um, so the project is, is a partnership with the City of Detroit, capital C, the government. Um, but it's not being run by the city. So this is something where there's a host of consultants like myself, like Jill, uh, like many others that I think, given the brevity of time, I, I won't be able to get into. But there's a, a really big, big team that's involved. It's a project that's actually been funded, though, by philanthropy. And what I think is interesting is that um, the same philanthropic funders that are at the table today uh, extend a, a legacy back to the very industries that actually formed Detroit and led to an incredibly one-dimensional economy that ultimately brought it to its knees. Uh, and they have come full, <laughs> full circle, and they've always really been there, but they're now there trying to pitch in to see what we can do, and for that we are definitely grateful. Um, and in some ways this is a, a great part of what, Detroit's, right, what Detroit still is. 
Uh, the Detroit Works project um, is many things to many folks, uh, but at the core of it, it is a strategic framework. Um, it's a framework for decision making. There are many folks within the city, private, public, big industry, CDCs, residents, whatnot, who've done for themselves for, for quite a long time, and they've People have taken care of business there, uh, but they've done it kind of off script, right? And so the idea here is to provide everybody a common framework to work from. So that, so that decisions that are being made that might make a heck of a lot of sense in one person's neighborhood uh, that may ultimately actually hurt the city overall are no longer the case. That, that every decision that's being made is, is looking to, to help uh, their individual area, but then also help the city uh, overall. So the project is coming to, to closure here uh, soon. Um, within the next month or so, we're going to deliver a massive report. Uh, it will be undergirded by tons and tons of, of course, data. Uh, data from the community and, and other, and other uh, data sources. So look for that coming out uh, in, in early December, and I think it's going to be a great document to have as a kind of precedent for, for, uh, for Flint as it, as it moves forward. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, while it is a framework for decision making, it is absolutely about transformation. right? This is really not the time for small steps. All right? It may be the time for small steps, but they need to lead to something huge. It needs to lead to a complete transformation to, uh, of, of, in, in almost every, every way. But to get there, we, it can't happen overnight. Right? You're not, we did, Detroit didn't get into the situation which it's in today uh, overnight, and it surely isn't going to get out of it overnight. Uh, so this really is about taking, taking some bite-sized pieces here. Right? Initially, out of the gate, how do we make sure that we can actually stabilize the city, say, in five years? How can we sustain it within 10? How do we make massive improvements to it uh, within a generation or so? And then how do we make sure that we can transform it overall in every possible way? Uh, within 50 years or so, right? But so a lot of times when I speak about this project publicly uh, to Detroit residents, I talk about it and I say, look, we have to ask ourselves, how do we, how do we think beyond ourselves, right? Beyond our own neighborhood, uh, to, to understand the, the betterment of the city as a whole, but also how do we think beyond our time here? Because many of the folks that I look at in the room and I'm presenting, um, perhaps myself included, are not gonna be here when we feel like the fulfillment of this plan is actually gonna come through. It's a sobering fact, but it's real. And we want people to understand that this is a big issue and it's going to take a long time and a lot of effort. So, um, and I think, you know, and I think I'd say also, and maybe this is a message for Flynn too, I think, I think that degree of honesty is very, very important in the public dialogue. So I would, I would urge that. So the project itself is really based on six planning elements, even though I'm showing you five, the sixth being civic engagement itself. But the five main planning elements that, that we've built this on, which makes it quite comprehensive, is economic growth, the city systems themselves, right, the infrastructure, a uh, part of this, uh, Jill spoke about earlier, uh, public land, um, public land as, a, as an asset in itself, uh, Center for Community Progress uh, is part of our team, in fact, Genesee County Land Bank is a great, uh, great example of, of, of uh, what we can do here, uh, the land use itself, for, and, and the image of the city through the land use, and then finally the neighborhoods themselves, uh, all of these pieces form the kind of core superstructure for the project. In every case, we're looking at a, a series of, of, uh, of realities, what's really happening on the ground, what's happening to folks, what's, what's uh, leading to what we see, what are the imperatives, what are the things we must do to address those realities, how do we make sure that as we do those things, we also dramatically improve the quality of life within Detroit, because today it is far too low. Um, and then ultimately, what are the strategies that continue to move the city forward, small steps, big steps, and the like. So I'm gonna walk through these uh, fairly quickly. I think there's gonna be a lot of stuff here, so hang on. Um, I'm not gonna get into neighborhoods just because I think we'll be able to clip through enough of it in the front end in the, in the first four to get through there. It's not by chance that I start with economic growth. Uh, the city of Detroit has lost about 25% of its population over the last 10 years. Um, it's down to about 715,000 uh, today. And uh, while that's dramatic, uh, and that a lot of folks talk about you know, uh, gaining population back, we think more important than that, much more important actually, is economic growth. Um, um, and and it's, it's why we, we begin our, our presentations on this with economic growth, and it's why it's the leading chapter in the report. And it has to do with a few different things, including the realities that we're seeing on the ground. Um, we may have lost a lot of population, but we're still dealing with some, some interesting issues here. The first is that we have an overall population to employment ratio within the city of Detroit that's four to one. For every four people, there's one job within the city. Most 
successful major American cities are around two to one, a little bit under, a little bit over. Those cities have good healthy employment sectors, they have good bond ratings, neither of which are true in Detroit, and this bears, bears it out, right? And, all, and, and within all that, right, of course, within the city of Detroit, we have really low workforce participation. They actually have more folks, on the whole, uh, ages 25 to 64, who are not part of the active labor force than who are. It's around 52%. So no matter what we do on the land side, right, and the land is kind of like the common denominator across this project, if we can't deal with this issue, it's, we're not going to be able to do anything. So we've got to make sure more folks are employed. We've got to recognize the fact that there are a lot of folks that actually, uh, that, that are working within the city, actually work outside the city, right? And, and in a city that's dominated by the car with a woefully inadequate public transportation system, that's a problem because you're limiting opportunity to a lot of Detroiters to actually flip that around. So, so this is beginning to, to reflect some of the, the reasons why we think it's so important. There are also major equity, gain, equity issues here to, to be addressed in a city that is a population, 83% of which is, is African American. Only 15% of the firms within the city are actually owned by African Americans. Equity matters and we need to improve it. Uh, so, so this, this I'll give you an example. There's going to be a little kind of sampler throughout each one of these. This is one of our big imperatives, right? The idea that we have to re-energize Detroit's economy to increase job opportunities for all Detroiters um, uh, within the city and then improve uh, the city's tax base itself. It's a big part of this. There's a whole host of transformative strategies. I'm not going to go through all these, but the big idea here is that we have to make sure that we can, we can uh, recognize, first of all, that job growth is really, really important. We've got to look at it. We've got to make sure that we can expand employment districts uh, that exist within the city today or around the city as a whole. Make sure that we do focus on, on uh, uh, minority business enterprise growth and that we, we begin to identify the key assets that we have in town right now, build on them, uh, strategically align them, and make sure that we understand that, that um, you know, modern, modern uh, uh, industry um, as it exists today can be combined with uh, new economy clusters and things like this. Today these things are held apart typically. We think they can actually be combined. So a big part of what we're doing then is we look at economic growth, and this is work that's been done by the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City out of Boston and the um, and, um, Interface Studios out of, out of Philadelphia, that's part of our team. We're looking at a number of different employment sectors, not just the creative and IT industries that you tend to focus on when you're, look, when you're working with the growth regime that exists downtown, right? So for us, it's about something much more than that. It is about industry. We talk about post-industrial cities, surely part of that is real, a major part of it is not. Detroit is still deeply industrial. It's a big part of the employment base. That type of employment provides jobs to a whole host of Detroiters whose educational backgrounds may not get them through the door in other firms, right? That's important. We can build on the industry we have, we can build on the Eds and Meds anchors that we have, which are some of the most significant actually in the country. Uh, we can build on a new economy that we understand and the local business-to-business -business operations that lead to greater entrepreneurial development. And as we do it, we need to make sure that we tie it back to uh, the actual land use itself, right? And that we begin to understand, I'm going to take this for a second, we begin to understand that, um, you know, the economic game in Detroit does not begin and end within the greater downtown, that it's actually arrayed across the entire city with concentrations of transportation, distribution, and logistics, uh, auto manufacturing, metals and machinery, food distribution and processing, uh, new uh, anchors up in the Northwest, Eds and Meds uh, anchors. There's a whole lot that's happening out there and we need to make sure that we can connect people to that. So land use, this is kind of at the whole, the, 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 the heart of, of the, the project itself, you know, how we can better utilize our land. So we have some startling realities here, right? Um, if you look at occupiable land, uh, 20 square miles of Detroit's occupiable land is vacant. Uh, it's a dramatic amount of, of land area. If you begin to add in the rights of way that, that link to that, you're looking at closer to 40 square miles out of a city that's about 139 square miles. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of overall um, housing unit vacancy, around 80,000 units uh, out of 360,000 are vacant. That is up uh, uh, two times from 10 years ago. So it's dramatically increasing as we move along. Um, and as, as we deal with this too, we've, we've got a lot of land that's just lying there kind of fallow and really underutilized, right? We need to find a better way to use that and be much more innovative in our, in our approaches to transform and ultimately increase the value of vacant land. And for us, value takes on a number of different dimensions. It does include money. Um, we need to find ways to, to get there. So this is about uh, cultivating and supporting the employment districts that I mentioned before, right? Each time we, we, we kind of taught, we dial back to this economic growth um, key point. 
We need to make sure that, that the land uses that we put in place can help to connect folks to the opportunity we're trying to create there. We also need to make sure um, that we can establish a system of innovative, ecological, and productive landscapes, particularly in those areas where no one lives anymore, right? And that's a big part of what we're trying to do. We also need to make sure that we can sustain a range of traditional um, and innovative urban neighborhoods overall. Um, there, there needs to be different types of places in which folks can live. So this is a, a pretty important diagram for us. I'm not giving you a lot of the background on it, but this is this, our decision-making framework. This is built uh, on a lot of physical conditions <coughs> analysis, community conversations, and market value analysis, including one that we did with the Reinvestment Fund out of Philadelphia. What it does is it begins to actually lay out a series of vacancy considerations and market dynamics that lead us to understand what we can do in certain areas, right, and what, make mo what might make the most sense. Blue areas you see here, lower vacancy, more stable markets. Orange areas, moderate vacancy, less stable markets. In the, in the purples, you're seeing high vacancy. Actually, an average of about 60% of the, par the parcels in those areas are vacant with extremely low market dynamics. The dark blue that's here is our greater downtown. While it has a fairly large amount of uh, land vacancy, uh, it actually has some of the strongest market considerations in the city overall. Those factors, as we, we begin to look at them and their total land area, begin to lay out what we think we can do in the near term and the long term. Today, no one has this common reference point. So someone, a CDC, and typically, by the way, they are located, they are concentrated heavily in the purple area. They'll say, hey, I've got a congregation here. I'll go to the city of Detroit. You guys give me three lots. I've got enough financing to come in to build three townhomes on there. That's not good. We can't do it anymore. Because there's not enough people here. You guys were talking about infrastructure before, right? We have extremely low densities in here, right? It's breaking the back of the city to deliver the services that they have to. That they have to. We can't continue to do that, so you have to actually put a hold there. This is where more of the land use policy begins to come in, uh, which is where we're at here. So this lays out a long-term land use strategy. You're actually seeing a 50-year land use strategy here. It's based on, a ho uh, based on a host of different land use typologies that I'll show you uh, far too quickly in one minute. Um, and um, it, what it does is begin to lay out a trajectory, right, to move from that framework map to something in the future that is truly sustainable for the city uh, overall, that can begin to adapt certain areas where you can, you can reinvest in certain areas for conventional development, right, but you can reinvest in others for different types of investment, more innovative functions, some of the things that Jill highlighted earlier. So in those areas in purple you just saw, there's, these are these areas here that we're showing, right? So these actually include um, innovative ecological areas, areas that we can actually begin on a very large scale over time to use to clean our air and clean our water. There are other areas over here that we can begin to use to actually uh, provide uh, food production, um, actually grow fuels, biomass, switchgrass, things like that. There are a lot of options, but they're not going to be the conventional ones that, that folks have uh, thought about in the past. So you can see that the breakdown of those typologies as they work through here from the top to the bottom, the neighborhood oriented ones to the top, landscape in the middle, and then industrial uh, to the bottom. At the end of the day, Detroit is an industrial town. These industries are going to remain, uh, and they're active and will be active uh, in the future. We'll give you a quick snapshot of what some of these typologies are. They're a little too small for you to see, and I apologize. Um, but really, this is about giving, again, this is a presentation that we give to the community, right? So we're trying to give folks an idea of what some of those land uses might be, the land uses that we show on the map. There are traditional residential neighborhoods with neighborhood centers and things like that. But every time we lay it out, we're actually laying out both a kind of Euclidean and form-based set of metrics so that in the future, folks can, can understand what it means to actually try to push this out and what it means to actually manage it and what it should yield from economic growth <coughs> Uh, to what it might need to, to supply uh, power uh, and, and sewage and water. Uh, so you have actually a kind of common reference point. It's also about other more densely packed uh, mixed use areas of which there are, are a few within the, within the city. It's also about some more innovative neighborhood types uh, that begin to deal with this, the, the, the conditions that we have in place. In the moderate vacancy areas, we have um, a significant amount of vacancy. We also have a lot of people living there. And those orange areas I showed you in the city alone, about 300,000 people that live there. You're not going to be moving all these people. They're going to be there. We have to find a way to actually improve their condition in place uh, uh, over time. And that's what these begin to speak to. In, you know, as you begin to use some of the blotting techniques that you talked about within, within intergrove, like you know, side lot disposition efforts, actually taking a lot of the publicly held lands to, to begin to link in um, different types of recreation in those areas and also begin to actually identify land assets that can be 
um, utilized to drive up greater development. Here are some of the landscape uh, types uh, that Jill spoke about earlier. Some industrial. I'm going to touch on city systems. I recognize them out of time. <laughs> it's a shame. Uh, so the big challenge is, and this, this came up, this has come up with Flint. I'll close on this. You know, the city systems that were designed in Detroit were designed for a population three times the size of what we have today, right? We can't, we can't continue to work with that. That's a big, big problem. So we actually, we have to recognize that in many areas, uh, as we've tracked it, we have, it, the cost to serve in those purple areas, it's about five times what it costs us. It costs us five times greater to serve each individual house in that area than it did in the past, right? 50 years ago when it was fully built out. We can't continue to support that. Uh, so we've got to find different ways to provide the services out there. And that's a big part of what this whole section's about. Even though this is probably the smallest, fine-grained, nerdy little document in the whole deal, this is really where, what it comes down to. A really organized uh, plan for strategic renewal in various systems. It deals with capital and operations. And it deals with different degrees of vacancy, different degrees of actual funding and revenue that can be brought in to support those systems. So those, that's at the, the kind of heart of it. Um, it's about using our land in better ways. I think you talked about this this morning before different transportation systems and a better utiliz utilization of our public land, of which we have a great deal, and actually providing an organized matrix for decision making that, that folks within the city, folks within private industry can actually use too. So, sorry I ran over, a uh, lot to cover, appreciate your attention. just been told that Michigan is not dead, but this microphone battery is, so I'm just going to talk loud. Um, question, people who are here. How many of you believe that people have the right to participate in the decisions that affect the places where they live? Anybody disagree with that? Okay, here's the thing. Even the most evil, manipulative people today believe that and say it out loud. And so, um, especially those of us in planning and architecture. Right? This is like the thing that gets said again and again about how important it is to have participation, um, etc. So, you know, for me, I think what becomes important at this stage of the game, because um, if you went back, I think the first law in the United States that recognized this right that all of us, all of we uh, believe in, uh, was in 1949, um, the Urban Renewal. Uh, which of course is remembered as one of the most devastating things to happen to cities. Um, lo and behold, it said in the law that if you're a city getting money from the federal government to knock down neighborhoods and build other things, you have to have public participation. So in some ways that battle was fought and won, at least formally, um, at least like 60, 70 years ago. So I think that the struggle that comes down to us today is not necessarily to try to convince people that public participation is good and important and nice, but is actually to look at the quality of that participation, to figure out how it really works, like what are really the nuts and the bolts when it comes down to, I think, what everybody has talked about already on this panel, of trying to blend something like the top down and the bottom up, whatever those things mean. Um, and, and for me, when you start to look at the nuts and bolts, you know, a lot of the, the biggest questions boil down to some simple things. They boil down to power and accountability. Like, who has the power to make things happen? And how do the people, um, how does anyone hold those people accountable for what they're doing? So, in the interest of that, I thought that rather than, um, I just got to hit that play button up in the corner. See on the, on the window itself? Yeah. Super. Um, so, in the interest of that, I thought I would not necessarily tell the story of a citywide master plan but to tell the story of a planning process and try to give you some sense of, again, how these things are actually woven together in an attempt to actually create a desirable situation around power and, and accountability. Um, and so this is a story about uh, the riverfront of the city where I, I uh, live and work. Anybody been to Newark before? Okay, a couple of people. And that, that hopefully besides the airport. Um, uh, so, uh, 
So if you don't know where Newark is, uh, this is Manhattan. Uh, on this side, you've got Brooklyn and Queens, eventually Long Island, and Newark is just kind of like the mirror uh, image of, of Brooklyn. And if you don't know anything about the history of planning and architecture in Newark, there's two things that I think are really important to know. Uh, number one, for a long time, the supposedly smartest and most well-informed and best trained and most powerful people who worked in planning and architecture in Newark thought that the biggest and best answer to the problems that Newark had, and Newark has been seen as a declining city since the early 1930s, um, they thought that the answer to the biggest problems that the city has was to demolish the city. Right, and so I'm sure that you can find some pictures like this of uh, cities here in Michigan. Um, you can't read it because it's too small. They basically like shaded in these kind of like amoeba areas of the city. Um, in some areas, uh, they say they're blighted, but they can be uh, uh, sort of uh, reinforced. But then for huge areas, all these ones colored in black, it says obsolete area, clear and rebuilt. Right, and so this was certainly not just popular in Newark. Um, go to the next one. So this is a map that's not even complete of all the areas that indeed were cleared and rebuilt. About a third of our inhabited city was that way. But there's something else too, which is what this picture is. So everywhere that that kind of activity went on, there was always resistance, and generally organized resistance. This is a placard from the 1970 mayoral election in Newark, where the first black mayor of a major East Coast city was elected. It was a huge deal, um, as I'm sure some of you can imagine. A king came to Newark in 68, about two weeks before he was assassinated, and he said, this is crazy. This city has had a majority African-American population for 10 years. Like, what a crime that, um, that political power has not reached that, that population. So these two forces, I think, again, super simplified, are, are, are really apparent in the history of Newark. So go to the next one. Um, if you go back through the newspaper articles, you can find these two things clashing at least since uh, the end of World War II. If you start to look at our city from the air, you can actually see in its physical structure um, areas that have been cleared and rebuilt sometimes twice and sometimes even three times, uh, only in the course of two generations. And if you start to look at ground level, I think you'll begin to see some of the things that also tell that, that story, but just in the very materiality of the city. Um, Part of what's behind this isn't just some kind of natural, organic process. Part of what's behind this is very much the stories that are told about the city. Um, one of these urban renewal projects cleared a whole central area of the city around the train station. And today, uh, the office buildings that were built in that place are connected to the train station and a lot of parking garages by sky tubes um, that are seen as really symbolic of this. And in fact, if you go into one of those sky tubes, this for me is always kind of like a haiku uh, from the powerful to elite, that kind of, uh, I'm sorry, from the powerful to Newark, that talks about their attitude about it. Basically, there's only one Newark, one stop to New York, one stop to the airport. You can get away quickly. <laughs> so these are just more pictures of kind of like the, the landscape that this continuous contest of seven years has produced. That's our Mies van der Rohe, same developer that did Lafayette Park. Um, and then if you go back one more. And so, so today, even the people, and a lot of them are my friends and colleagues, that do the branding and the public messaging for the city, I think, are still somewhat beholden and prisoner of some of these older narratives. So for example, um, two blocks away, actually these slides are reversed, go to the last, go to the next one. Next one, yeah. So uh, this right here is Broad and Market. It's the center of our traditional downtown about 30,000 people get on and off of buses at this intersection. But yet, now go backwards, uh, some of the folks who are in charge of branding for the city said, what we should do is have a slogan that says, downtown Newark, it's yours to rediscover. As if a place that has 30,000 people coming in and out of it um, needs to be rediscovered. So now go two forward. And for me, this again comes down to stories. And so um, I grew up mostly in the 1980s. And I think I really absorbed a lot of stories about American cities that, again, tried to naturalize, I think, what were actually uh, processes of power. Um, and this is the way the story went. It said, beginning of the 20th century, things are awesome. You have a lot of immigrate, immigrants coming, mostly from Europe. They're working hard. They're shopping downtown at the department stores. They're going to movie theaters. 
and things are, are pretty nice. And then a lot of other things happen, like maybe you would talk about highways being built out to the suburbs or the GI Bill, but most often I think what people talk about is the Great Migration. Like two waves of great migration of African Americans that came up from the South that totally changed, you know, literally the complexion and the culture and the life of American cities. And in this story, that event is generally told as nothing except a pure trauma, something that just happened that was bad. Um, and the next thing, but luckily, uh, that story is over now, and like cities are awesome again, and there's an urban renaissance, right? And we all can like live like friends. So, <laughs> as I hope it's really clear, I have a lot of issues with this story, although I think it's still a very prevalent one, and one that actually drives decisions not just about tourism, but actually about investment, about design, um, and about a lot of other things. Um, so, for me, working in Newark, and, and I don't mean this to be racially exclusive at all, but I think that the question has to become, what is a different vision, a different story of a post-Great Migration American city? You know, what does it mean to be what was you know, called in the 1970s a proud black city? And again, I don't mean that at all to be uh, just an African American thing. So I want to tell you a story about our riverfront. Um, this is a picture of uh, the part of the riverfront I'll be talking about. Um, it's about five miles long. About 80 different entities own the land along here. And uh, we have another part of our riverfront, another five miles, that borders the biggest seaport in the country. I'm not going to talk about today, although there's a lot of interesting things to say about it. But this is the part that touches again, neighborhoods and downtown, et cetera. And so now I'm going to tell you uh, five very generic, they're true of a lot of different places. In fact, a lot of these things in this, in this uh, particular story are not uh, brave new innovations in rocket science. They're just trying to put together things that you find. Um, but the first generic but true thing is that the river was the reason there were people in this place from the beginning. Um, whether it was Native Americans fishing there, or the first uh, Puritans who came who wanted to found a theocratic society, or of course people who built factories, and most importantly the people that came to work in those factories. Second, generic but true thing is that one of the outcomes of that history was a pretty scary legacy of environmental degradation. So this um, nicely decorated area with these planted pots is the former site of something that sounds really nice and lucky, the Diamond Shamrock Factory, right? Uh, they made, uh, among other things, a lot of pesticides. They made DDT for a long time. That became illegal. When that became illegal, they found a new business in chemical weapons. They made Agent Orange on this site uh, for about 40 years and then dumped one of the most poisonous byproducts of that dioxin into the river, which resulted in a 17-mile-long Superfund site, which I can tell you more about. Again, not so unique, but very true. Third generic but true thing, if you go down to the river's edge today, you'll find what planners in their exquisite jargon will call underutilized properties. <laughs> and then, and then the, the very last uh, thing that's generic but true is that all of these things are not for lack of planning and not for lack of investment in planning. And this is again where accountability becomes so important. So when I started this job and of the, the 10 things they asked me to do, I was the chief urban designer for the city. Uh, they said, hey, why don't you look at that riverfront? There's been some talk about it, I hear. And they gave me a stack of uh, plans. You know, going back to the late 1960s, that was about four feet tall. Now, all but one of these plans had been uh, sponsored by a very powerful constituency in the city, which was generally downtown landowners. And those downtown landowners, since at least the 30s, had generally not lived in the city itself. And so most of these plans, as you can probably see from some of these excerpts, were very much about best case scenario real estate investment type plans, right? Where um, there's lots of different plans in the world, lots of different flavors of plans. And I think that an educated uh, constituency really needs to figure out how, how to distinguish between them. Um, certainly many of these plans are of the type where you hire some architects and, and planners to draw some really big buildings, and you hope some developer sees it and says, yeah, I feel like spending like $500 million. Okay, so that's the next. Um, so similar to what, what Brent, Brent said, that has become a, a kind of you know, a trendy approach, we took two lessons from that history. Um, one was that even if the most powerful people in your city, the people with the most money, are behind the plans, that might not be enough. They even themselves might not have enough people to make something happen. The second thing was, I think partially because of this historic view of the elite towards the city, um, generally the notion was like, well, 
the city is pretty busted, the people here are pretty busted. So unless we have maybe a billion dollars to totally transform it, or at least make a brand new city kind of inside the city, it's not worth doing anything. And so I was really lucky that when I came into this job, I started looking through uh, some of the budgets, and it turns out that in fact, that attitude was so strong that they had pulled down a couple of different uh, funding sources to do different kinds of public improvements that amounted to like $6 million, but it had just been sitting there for about eight years. Again, because of this notion of it, it's not, uh, uh, it's not totally transformative, it's not worth doing anything. So what I'm going to do now is tell you three areas of activities that we've done around this particular waterfront. It really treats about 250 acres, um, which in the scheme of things is not that big. So we go to the next one. So the first category is organizing. And for me, this was really the most important thing to drive activity around, again, power and accountability, which was how can we actually weave people together to get something actually worthwhile to happen in Newark, that riverfront, the, the riverfront that Newark wants. Next one. So we start off by setting an arbitrary goal, um, just something to kind of mark uh, some, some distance, which was two cents from two percent. We wanted to involve two percent of Newarkers, you know, a pretty modest goal, in somehow remaking this place of the riverfront and the way that it functioned in, in the overall city. <coughs> Um, I had to throw this in there because there was some discussion about the master plan, and um, and what this is is you know Wacker's manual. Anyone come across this like trivial? But no, one guy does. What is Wacker's manual? All the first major attempts to try to imagine alternative ways of thinking about cities, wasn't it? Yeah, what's well, connected to that? So this was connected to the the master plan of Chicago in the beginning of the 20th century, which was a bunch of like rich business people being like, we want to hire some architects to design some beautiful things, and therefore we can steer public investment. Along with that, they were thinking about implementation. You know, again, their notion was to get their, their plan implemented, and they said, well, we might convince the adults, but that's not enough. Like, we need to somehow indoctrinate the kids. And so what they did is they wrote a textbook for eighth graders that's still used today in the city of Chicago, which is Wacker's Manual, which generally tries to say, you should have a lot of patriotism in your city, and therefore, like, love our plan. So I don't think it's exactly <laughs> enough, but I, I think it, it, it's an interesting tool. So, so for me, like along somewhat similar lines, I was pretty new to Newark in 2008, so to learn about this riverfront, one of the many things I was asked to look at, I started hanging out with some teenagers, most of whom who had grown up along the riverfront. Uh, we did things that people in architecture and art studios do. We walked around, took pictures, talked to people. Go to the next one. Uh, we made maps. Uh, this one, uh, some of the students were really excited to find a dead bird. Um, they also found like some uh, some old boxer shorts, which was very, like, sparked a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> uh, we went around and talked to different stakeholders, uh, community development organizations, real estate developers, like really important major landowners and others. And then we started to come up with some of our own visions. And again, like, really far out, crazy stuff that, you know, 12-year-olds um, will suggest. So, like, uh, a factory that makes just the smell of chocolate, or a roller coaster that goes along uh, the edge of, of, of the river. Uh, we then made a model of the way that we thought that the riverfront should look in the year 3000. And so we had a, you know, our plan had an end date, but we had some generous kind of time in there. This was a floating hotel. Um, and then the most important thing, which is the next slide, is that, you know, this had certain objectives. I worked with teachers in terms of like what was the experience for the students. But my ulterior motive as the urban designer for the city was to get these young people to just put this space on people's mental maps um, in the rest of the city. And so this is our model. Our mayor came and cut a little ribbon on the little model. Um, the news showed up. Uh, we uh, then installed the model in the front entrance of City Hall. And hopefully it was weird enough looking that like some people as they came to pay their water bill would spend three minutes thinking about the riverfront and we thought that that was progress towards our goal. You may have heard about a plan to spruce up the Passaic River area in Newark. But the journey goes far beyond cleaning up a blighted area. As News Call New Jersey's Rick Holmes shows us, the new vision could bring hundreds of jobs and even several new building projects. They to totally made that up as the news uh, always goes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I gotta, I, I'm seeing all this trash out here. You weren't cleaning up the trash? No. It was not done. It's a mess out here. The work began with a group of Newark teens who wanted to learn more about their hometown river. Do you have to walk the river? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, walk, yeah, see what was down here, really, like, get up close and personal with them. Their work is paid off. Newark City Hall wants to turn the Newark Riverfront into a brand. You go ahead, Chris. Several projects. So, so again, this is mostly totally made up by, by the news, um, but, uh, but for me the really great thing was, and certainly there's a simplification as all stories are, is that they actually told the story, like some teenagers like, had this idea and then like, the whole government was like, yeah, like, we'll do your idea. <laughs> you know, and, and for me that actually was like, a really positive you know, way to advance the PR of the project. Um, the next thing that we wanted to do was actually give people a chance just to come see this space for themselves. So we were able to get some funding from the National Endowment uh, for the Arts, of all places, and we were able to sponsor a series of walking tours and book tours. So this was our first um, postcard for our first year of this back in 2009. I got to collaborate with a guy who did a lot of dance club flyers. Um, his company was called Infamous Designs. You can come and go on. And so this was, uh, uh, at this point, for in the last four years, we've taken about 3,000 people out on these tours. Um, this woman has a great t-shirt, Haters Make Me Famous, so that's one of our slogans in Newark. Um, keep on going. Uh, we go in and we meet actually local business people, and the idea is just to try to like weave our own imagination of this place back together. Like We know there's business people there, we know there's train tracks, we know there's other things, but how do these things actually fit together? Um, rather than seeing kind of this as an opportunity for a whole new place, uh, first we're trying to take account of the things that are there. Um, these are some of our postcards from recent years. Uh, we started a you know, website on wordpress.com, it's free. Um, about uh, 5,000 people go there a month now. And we also try to organize rich people, because that's really important too, because they are powerful and they have some stuff. Um, so we had our first wine on the water last summer. Ahoy. Um, and uh, keep on going. And, and so this was how we were doing at the end, end of last year. I have to do the numbers again for this year to see how we're doing on our 2% uh, goal. Um, and this thing up in the upper right, you can keep on going, was one of the most promising things. And so as we got into doing the zoning anew, which I'll mention very briefly at the end, a number of community organizations that didn't really have any prior history of, of collaboration came together to write this one-page list of just vision points for what they wanted to see for the future of this riverfront and the future of this space and they got about 700 people to sign it. So in terms of wanting there to be a constituency and seeing that as the only viable way for anything worthwhile to happen, this was a small but promising sign. Okay, so that was all organizing. Second thing was building stuff. People had been talking about this again from the late 60s, so we knew that even if it just meant building a postage stamp to give people a little bit of faith that something could happen, that that was totally critical. So when the FBI, which has a building on the riverfront, which is a long story, wanted to put up a big fence, we were just we started off with small things being like, can you make the fence green? Can you make the fence green? Okay, yes, keep on going. Um, when the Army Corps came and had a little bit of federal money to help rebuild the bulkhead, the wall between the water and the land, and they came back and said, okay, we're done, so we're gonna put it back the way we found it by spreading gravel over the whole thing, we said, can you please just like put six inches of topsoil in some meadow grass, which after a lot of hoot and hollering, they finally did. Next one, hey, keep on going. Um, but the biggest thing was that we actually had some money, like I said, about, about $6 million initially, and that was supposed to go for a, uh, a walkway project here in our downtown um, to accompany a real estate project that never happened. So one of the biggest things that I got to have a hand in changing with a number of other people was changing the site of that first public space on the riverfront. Let's go to the next one. And the way we made the decision, moving from the downtown where maybe we could get some like office workers to eat lunch, but it wasn't clear who else, we actually discovered that there was a neighborhood that number one had a really long history of activism around environmental justice, like trying to get rid of like fat rendering plants uh, next to where they lived or uh, dumps or medical waste incinerators or all kinds of nasty things that were located in their neighborhood. And that after a while, they had actually started not just to fight against things, but to find a couple things they wanted to fight for. And one of the things they wanted to fight for was more parks in their neighborhood, which had the lowest number of parks in the overall city. They had run a campaign uh, back in the early 2000s around this. So they seemed to be total no-brainer partners in this project. So next. So uh, that was really borne out when we started having design meetings at City Hall after a long work day, like Wednesday nights, and we would have 
uh, not infrequently over 100 people come out to talk about what will be in this park, what will it look like, uh, how could it actually help our neighborhood beyond just being a nice place to be. Next. Keep on going. Are you headed? Oh, it's, it's time out, okay. Um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, just uh, to finish up, um, this year we had the first piece of park on the riverfront ever to exist in the city open up, which is this piece over here. As you can tell, it's mostly active sports. Um, we had a big party on June 2nd. Keep on going. Uh, we had a walk to the water led by the Malcolm X Shabazz marching band which for us was really important. Now we have a really high degree of Latino African American segregation in our city and the neighborhood where this was going happened to be one of the heavily Latino neighborhoods. So when the idea first came up to have the Malcolm X Shabazz marching band lead to the walk to the water to celebrate the 30 year triumph of this neighborhood to get a riverfront park, some people were like, well, what do they have to do with us? Um, so uh, the way that this works is we walk, we walk two miles and go to the next one. One more, one more. Well, actually, go back and we'll just end it with that. So this is a video of the Walk to the Water uh, that led to the park that included things like Brazilian martial arts and capoeira. Um, <coughs> walk to the Water North! 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 Just to conclude, I mean, for me, like the biggest lessons learned have been how to actually try to create actually workable alliances, how to go beyond civic engagement into things like popular education that actually try to reveal the mechanisms of state power to people who have a real interest in how a state uses its power or a city, uh, and to really not see design and planning as things that really smart people make and then uh, other people should, be, should feel really lucky to receive them, but actually to see all of those things as a constellation uh, between which we have to connect the dots. Thank you. So we are about 45 minutes past what we said we would be, <laughs> and I blame the panelists because there's so much great information and stories about yeah. cities around the country. Um, so I have to plead with the panelists, who I think you guys were scheduled to leave by now, if you could stay for a couple of questions, um, either from Dan or from uh, anyone in the audience. Is that cool? Can we stay for like 10 more minutes? Meaning 15 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, okay. Um, David, do you want to come back up? Um, I, I mean, I'm supposed to moderate, but they pro people probably have better questions than mine, but I do want to maybe uh, just kick it off with one question, which is really pressing for me. Um, which was the, uh, the issue of, of regions. Um, where were they? And uh, I'm just curious, I mean, you know, Brent, the, the idea of any kind of metropolitan-wide planning or working with the suburbs wasn't part of the, um, you know, the, the vision, right? Um, and Megan, I'm curious, if we didn't hear much about Genesee County and, and, and the master plan process. Where's Dan? He had to take off. Okay, so every, all those, or so uh, you know, all those, all those drawings, right, were just of the city. And there's a question like, to what extent can can Detroit actually, or Newark, right, actually do anything by itself without the cooperation of the suburbs, where so much of the wealth, so much of the resources, are, and you know, and arguably, you know, um, so I just it's not a, it's not a question that's meant to be critical of any any of the work we saw here, which is all amazing. It's meant to provoke a discussion about. Where is the rest of the metropolitan area in all these projects? Well, for, for us, it's actually a key component. And one thing to note is that, um, and for those who are Flint residents, I think this is kind of a, a um, hap, 
happy thing or something that we can build upon while we're losing uh, population uh, our I don't um, I feel like I'm a loud, loud talker and <laughs> yeah, you probably don't need it um, the, actually the, the daytime population in Flint is growing and in fact, our daytime population is about 150,000 people. And that's because we, we are uh, the region's sort of um, economic center. And so I think it's really key to recognize that we're an important part of the county and we need to take advantage of working with the county. Um, and in addition to that, I think in order to um, deal with the infrastructure cost, we're looking at a lot of opportunities about sharing uh, with the county to, to defray some of the costs, particularly around um, water services and, and sanitation and sewage. So, you know, the county is a key partner and we're actually collaborating with the county. A lot of the county planners are involved on the advisory groups, so um, our goal is very much to integrate them into our process. But do they want to work with you? I think yes. I mean, they, they have willingly come to the table and so, like I said, they volunteered, um, many of their c kind of key decision makers volunteered to participate in our planning process, and I think that's, that says a lot. No? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, you know, Newark is a place where actually, like, its regionalism is both, like, this amazing promise, but also this, like, tremendous burden and albatross in the sense that in Newark, at least, you have a lot of people whose families left the city to live in the suburbs who didn't see it somehow as their choice, and they see themselves somehow deeply dispossessed by the people who live in the city today. Um, you know, and so it's this funny thing where you have all these people in the region who both see themselves as very, very rooted uh, in the city itself, and I think therefore their potential collaborators, potential supporters. We've actually been really surprised on the boat tours that I mentioned quickly, how many people from the suburbs are really excited to come to this. And, you know, and of course we're like, maybe we should charge people more if they don't live in the city. Um, but at the same time, there's like clearly this like deep trauma that accompanies like any thinking about that rootedness and that, and that togetherness. I mean, you know, a, a river and a watershed is, is kind of an amazing, you know, an easy metaphor too in the sense that, um, you know, just like in Michigan, I know a little bit from Detroit, you know, the water that, uh, that about two million people in North Jersey drink, and there's only about 300,000 people in Newark, comes from Newark, right? And so, you know, those kinds of ties and intertwinings are really unavoidable, but how we actually find a way to work them to, to deal, I guess, with the positive possibilities and try to, you know, therapeutically deal with uh, the negatives is, is the big question. I mean, um, any time I've ever done planning, I always feel like I uh, just bang my head against the wall because you can't make regions. There are a few structures for regional decision making, right? Um, and uh, so I, I assume that's one reason why all those drawings are just of Detroit and not of the surrounding counties. Anything north of eight miles is just um, people who uh, there's no there's no process, right, to engage engage in metropolitan. Area. Anyway, um, let's open it up to questions. Yes, sir. I, I have one thing I'm curious about, and some I've, I have not looked at, but what I'm struck at looking at these long abandoned places that we, you know, that collectively bring people together and try to come up with a vision of what do you do in 130 acres of a former Chevy lot or 250 acres of a waterfront that's these sites. And I'm wondering, are there any lessons to be learned from all the um, military bases that were closed, where you suddenly had, you know, 150 acres of something where we're shutting down everything on the base and go do something. And now we're 20 years down the road. Some of those bases are now finally being completely built out. And I'm wondering, are there lessons to learn from that and to how you deal with this vacancy into vibrancy? So, yeah, all over the country, military bases have been repositioned for like the last 15 or so years due to sometimes the Department of Defense downsizing, not always, sometimes. Um, those bases are often in really different kinds of markets. So, 
they're so diverse that it, it's hard to draw a single conclusion about them, but one example would be the Presidio in San Francisco, which is about as scenic mm -hmm. a type of property as you can imagine. Um, we have many in Massachusetts that are more just kind of rolling hillsides and forests. So many times they're, they're a lot easier to reposition, A, because the market is stronger, B, because you don't have the legacy of pollution quite in the same way. You'll have spot areas of pollution on those sites, which you can kind of fence off and remediate, but it doesn't lock you away from using the entire property's potential. So oftentimes they can be returned to nature or turned into regional office parks. Um, in places like Colorado, they can be turned into actual new neighborhoods as they happen in Orlando, Florida as well. So they're very, very situational, and it's hard to draw a single lesson from those, those military base reuses in, in, uh, in, in my experience. Yeah, I, I concur completely. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. James? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that, uh, about planning is that I think the body of land use plans, they kind of they kill the city. Because I live in Los Angeles, and we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of land use issues there. We also have a big Latino population. And the way, that, the way they use the land goes against all the land use plans. Like, you, for instance, street vending. You have, a, you have a street vending in every corner in, in LA, but it's all illegal. <laughs> so it's not really there on paper, but it's happening. And I think, I think planning, and planning has to be really kind of flexible to really deal with these changes. And what I, th what I tell people is that, you know, we, we make these plans that are 20 years old, and planning changes daily. And we need to have really flexible, you know, plans that can really, like, look at all this great vacant land here. You know, what if you just said, what if there was no zoning on this land here? Because uh, that's what kind of built America, was all this creativity and all this freedom. They can look at L.A., you know, Howard Hughes came out there and built airplanes, the Hollywood industry came out there and built mo make movies, and there was no zoning there. They just came out and did it because they had the land, and now it's a resource. And I think looking at, again, going back to how we start to, like, decouple all these zoning laws that really regulate people's thinking really, can, can really kind of foster a lot of energy that can people, uh, people have inside them. I think that would be really interesting to kind of look at that land of asset here and how you can kind of really kind of make that creativity happen in, in Flint. Absolutely, I think we're looking at creating flexible zoning that looks more on uh, design and less on use so that we can evolve with, you know, the creative and innovative things that are going on. Man, I would just say, like, freedom always sounds great, but, you know, at least like in, in my city, you know, people are really concerned with control, you know, and they don't want to be controlled, but they want to have democratic control over their neighborhoods, and if that means you know, and oftentimes that means like they don't, you know, they, you know, we'll get calls being like, I heard that there's a liquor store open up on Clinton Ave, like can't we like make that illegal? You know, and, and certainly not as simple as that, but you know, I think that for me, you know, thinking back again to like the, the origins of zoning, which was like a complex and contested notion, at least somewhere in there, you know, once we got past the Ladies Mile uh, fancy shops on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan that didn't want the garment factories coming over there, therefore they want to use separation. We also, though, have, I think, a lot of totally understandable, legitimate, and um, and supportable notions that people want control over their neighborhood. They want to be able to have a collective process. They don't want someone being able to come in next door and open a fat rendering plant. So I guess I get a little bit uh, nervous about just kind of like the vision of unimpeded market-based freedom. And um, Megan, you probably are aware we have the emergency manager of Michigan. And, uh, and I'm very impressed how um, you're able to move forward with your planning process. Uh, in Pontiac, we have more of a situation of disengaging the community. Um, the community has kind of been told to go outside and sit down and shut up because they don't want to hear you. Um, the community engagement has been coming from community driven endeavors like the Sesper Centennial Celebration that uh, I've been on that commission. Megan, how have you been able to actually work with your um, emergency manager to move forward like that? Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm a, I'm a loud, loud talker. Um, in any event, we're, we're really fortunate with the selection of our emergency manager, which who was a long time um, Flint resident, who was actually our interim mayor. And so he, um, he was really always pushing for us to do a master plan. So um, when he was appointed and um, 
the, the city to decide to move forward with the, we received HUD funding to do the master planning process. And now we have an emergency financial manager too, uh, and our emergency manager now is our uh, city administrator. But I have to say that they both, I think it's really hard for them and they've taken the, the position that they're often having to make decisions in an, a vacuum, in an emergency, where they don't have any data and they don't really know what the community vision is. So they see that this master plan process is an opportunity to really get that type of information. And um, a lot of times their decisions are solely motivated on cost saving measures. And that's not really good policy for the future. So I think they actually see this as a, a, as a tool for them and they're really excited and they've taken the, um, the stance that they want to involve our team more and more on decisions like uh, demolition. Like, let's be more targeted about our demolition. Let's not just demolish, you know, wherever, but let's see where we have the best opportunity to transform neighborhoods. So um, I think I've been really lucky. I think that's not been the experience of a lot of the other uh, cities with emergency managers. Um, I've also heard challenges in other ones like Benton Harbor that haven't had that same kind of um, support. So I'm, I'm fortunate. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Sort of uh, one of the background premises of the idea of putting together this conversation had to do with the idea that there were two components that would potentially contribute to a great plan for the city, one of them being a really great process that had a, a high level of involvement and produced uh, you know, a community uh, vi vision. The other one being that there, there, there might be some kind of um, vision that would come from just a great story, a great I idea that wasn't necessarily born out of process, but that would be born by some kind of inventive, uh, creative solution that maybe only a designer or someone with specialized skills might be able to produce. Um, and I, I read all three of you as being kind of against or at least strongly de-emphasizing the idea that there are specialized skills or uh, pe people who have, sp who, who have the ability to create a vision that isn't uh, um, pr produced by the, the community. Can you all comment in some way about like, to what extent some, some kind of image or identity or vision might require a specialist type of knowledge um, and uh, yeah. That's so just very quickly, the, the planning field for the last 30 or 40 years has been in a, a period of um, self-criticism over what it perceives as the cardinal sin of allowing designers to have too much power with the resulting fact that many planners favor a purely bottom-up approach. I think the interesting thing about legacy cities is that the scale of problems is so large that it completely forbids a purely bottom-up approach. So why I talk with my talk top-down or ad hoc and said it, it can't really be either of, either or. But it doesn't mean that an approach where there are ideas about the city that don't, that are not simply generated from a parcel by parcel perspective, they're tempered by the reality that there are citizens who are active and engaged and care about what happens to the community. But there are also larger realities of the city, like shared streets, shared infrastructure patterns, shared open spaces, shared natural systems, about which decisions are going to be made that aren't going to be made on a parcel by parcel basis. And I think some kind of intersection of those realities is where we should be headed in the field. I don't think we're there yet because I think we've come out of a period where we really have favored a purely bottom-up approach and now we're realizing it's too small a scale for some of the problems that we face. Yeah, and, and just to add, I think um, we, we kind of recognize that there needs to be both um, in the way that we set up our advisory groups, um, which are meant to kind of feed into the system and provide kind of ongoing uh, feedback on the master plan. 
we have uh, two-thirds residents, but one-third of that group is comprised of what we call content knowledge experts. And these are people who can bring kind of fresh ideas because as a resident, you know, it, it's hard sometimes to think about your community differently and think about some innovative opportunities. And a lot of the residents have asked for that. They're anxious to hear other perspectives and other ideas that, that could really transform Flint in a way that they haven't really thought about. So I, I think we're trying to build both into our process. Yes, Stephen, no offense, but it sounds like we all think that you got it wrong. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that expertise is, is utterly critical. I think the way we treat expertise is a really important question. So that, you know, the way I think of it, which maybe sounds just jargony, is that we need to really take expertise and like disassemble it, right, into like a kit of parts. So that other people can pick up those tools and use them. But by no means, that, that by no means is that does that, uh, I think, involve taking all the experts out back and like doing something to them. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, like, I do think that vision is a real problem. And like the history of the idea of vision is like a real problem. Um, you know, not that I'm opposed to creativity, you know, even though we live at a time right now where it really seems that the official line is that like vibrancy and creativity can like fill any void and like fill any stomach, which I just don't think any of us can accept. Um, and I guess that, like, from my like very abbreviated understanding of the last hundred years of planning and design and working on cities, it certainly seems that the idea of vision is much more often put to use to to subdue differences than it is to actually like create consensus. And I guess in the in the end, for me, life is complicated to the point and sometimes delightfully unexpected, and sometimes obviously tragically so, but that the notion of a vision that somehow will like, inspire all of us to go out and do something is just like really hogwash. And like again, that's why I go back to like power and accountability. Like what we need is a system, like maybe democracy, where we all can come together out of our individual lives, which shouldn't ever end, um, and actually come to some kind of collective decision making you know, under some kind of accepted shared form of rules, and then we can evaluate the outcome to see, like, did that go the way it was supposed to or not? Like, I don't think, I mean, I think that, you know, vision is uh, the driver of a political process, like, much closer to, like, fascism, right? Like, the, the image of Mussolini that we see where it's, like, Mussolini made up of, like, everyone else's heads. <laughs> uh, 